Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we learned how to create statistical plots in Julia by using several different plotting packages. Today, we'll get an introduction to data frames, which is one of the most powerful packages available in Julia for data analysis. As a lead-in to data frames, we're going to take a journey starting with a Hubble matrix in base Julia. We will then take the leap from a matrix to a table by taking a closer look at the type tables package that we saw in last week's tutorial. Next, we'll see another application of a table by using the pretty tables package. The knowledge that we gain from this journey will provide the foundation for understanding data frames. Data frames is a very large package. Rather than trying to cover it all, I will focus on the basics that will get you up and running. Even with just focusing on the basics, it will still take me a few tutorials to cover the material. We have a lot to cover, so let's get going. Let's set up the programming environment for today's tutorial. Open VS Code and maximize the terminal panel. Start the REPL by holding down the ALT key and then hitting J and O. Make a new directory called tutorial02 by 06 by using the make directory function. Change your present working directory to your new directory by using the change directory function. Enter the package REPL by hitting the close bracket. Activate your new directory by typing in activate space period and then hit enter. Add the following packages and versions. Type in status to confirm that all of the correct packages and versions have been added. Exit the package REPL by hitting backspace. Minimize the REPL. Create a new file by going to File, New File. Save the file as tutorial02x06.jl by going to File, Save As. Be sure to save your file in your new directory. I'm going to add a header to my file, but there's no need for you to type this in. You can access the source code for this tutorial in my GitHub repository. The link is in the description below. Before we get to data frames, let's get a refresher on the Julia matrix. I've included some data in the description below. You can just copy and paste them here. There are five column vectors named brand, tier, quantity, price, and cost. Here, quantity is measured in units, while price and cost indicate price per unit and cost per unit. Select all of the data rows and hit Shift Enter. Here's your challenge. Given this raw data, complete the following tasks. One, create a single matrix containing all of this data. Two, calculate the revenue, profit, and profit margin for each line item. Three, calculate company A's totals for quantity, revenue, and profit. Four, calculate company A's overall profit margin. And five, create another matrix containing the totals for quantity, revenue, profit, and profit margin. Let's see how we can do this in base Julia without adding any packages. The first step is to create a matrix. That was easy enough. Hovering over the output in your editor displays the matrix. Using a blank space in between the vectors creates a horizontal concatenation of the vectors in your matrix. Here's a quick reminder of how to index a column or a row in a matrix. My matrix is a 3 by 5 matrix. In a Julia matrix, the first number is the row, and the second number is the column. Using a colon here means that you want all of the rows. Since index numbers start at 1 in Julia, the 4 here means that you want the fourth column. 
So this syntax means that you want all of the rows in column four. In this matrix, column four contains the price vector. The same syntax applies to selecting rows. Here, the two means that you want the second row in the matrix. The colon here means that you want all of the columns. So this syntax means that you want all of the columns in the second row. In this matrix, the economy tier is in the second row. Okay, with that refresher out of the way, let's get back to our challenge. The next step is to calculate the revenue. The revenue is just the quantity times the price per unit. My revenue is a new vector that contains the calculated revenues for each row. We need to add this new vector to our matrix. So our original 3x5 matrix is now a 3x6 matrix. Next, we need to calculate the profit. The profit is the quantity times the difference between the price per unit and the cost per unit. My profit is a new vector that contains the calculated profit for each row. We need to add this new vector to our matrix. So our original 3x5 matrix is now a 3x7 matrix. Next, we need to calculate the profit margin. The profit margin is just the profit divided by the revenue. My margin is a new vector that contains the calculated profit margin for each row. We need to add this new vector to our matrix. So our original 3x5 matrix is now a 3x8 matrix. Next, we need to calculate the totals for quantity, revenue, and profit. Now that we have the totals, we need to calculate the overall profit margin for the company, which is just the total profit divided by the total revenue. Now that we've completed our calculations, we just need to create a new matrix to hold all of our totals. Okay, that's it. We've completed our challenge. Let's take another look at our matrix. Clearly, we can perform some basic analysis in base Julia without the aid of any packages just by using a matrix. However, how useful is this matrix? Can you remember what's contained in all of these columns? Which column is price again? Which column is quantity? If it's confusing with this small example, Imagine how confusing it will be with a large data set. It would be nice if we could convert our little matrix into a table with some header names. That would make our data more practical. Computers may not need the header names in order to perform calculations, but we, humans, find them helpful. Before moving on, let's save our matrix as a CSV file. View your CSV file in the Explorer. Close your CSV file tab and close the Explorer. According to Wikipedia, tidy data is a dataset where each variable is a column and each observation is a row. When it comes to computational data analysis, all of your data should be in this format. Always have your variable names along the top going from left to right. Never have variable names going down the rows along the left-hand side. This tidy data format is what we normally think of when we say table. But what exactly is a table? This may seem like a silly question, 
but programmatically, it turns out to be a very important question. Conceptually, a table is just a matrix with header names and row identifiers in this tidy data format. However, programmatically, there are many different ways to achieve this, so this poses a challenge for package developers. If each package author is using a different definition of a table, then the various packages may not be able to communicate with each other. In Julia, many of the packages depend on the specifications for a table that are defined in the tables.jl package. The primary author of the tables package is Jacob Quinn, who is the author of several useful packages in the Julia ecosystem, of which tables.jl is one. Tables.jl is the glue that allows packages like type tables, pretty tables, and data frames to communicate with each other. Currently, there are over 100 Julia packages that are integrated with tables.jl. One would think that the tables.jl package would be a good one to add and to use. However, it is surprisingly difficult for end users to use. The tables package is designed for package developers and not for end users. For us as end users, the tables.jl package should be invisible and should simply be running unseen under the hood. Now, let's take a closer look at the type tables package that we used last week to get a better idea of the difference between a matrix and a table. Let's start by setting up a table that is the equivalent of our matrix. When creating a table in type tables, we place the header name on the left followed by an equal sign, and then the column vector on the right. As you can see, hovering over the output is becoming a bit challenging. Maximize the REPL and type in my table to view your table. So that looks a lot nicer, right? We have column headers along the top and row indices along the left. Minimize the REPL and go back to the editor. Let's see how we can view the data from a table. In order to view a column from the table, we use the dot syntax. You can view the rows from a table just like you view rows in a matrix. The difference is that the output contains the header names. Unfortunately, you cannot see the entire output by hovering in VS Code. You need to view it in the REPL. You can also view your table using VS Code Display. Unfortunately, VS Code Display does not show the row numbers, but otherwise, it looks great. Now save your table as a CSV file using the CSV package. View your CSV file in the Explorer. CSV stands for Comma Separated Value. The primary author of the CSV package is Jacob Quinn. Yes, that Jacob Quinn, the same author who wrote the tables package. So what's the difference between the CSV package and the delimited files package? The built-in delimited files package is intended to read and write Julia arrays. It is not designed to handle tables or data frames. Not surprisingly, the CSV package is integrated with the tables package. This integration allows any Julia package that is integrated with tables.jl to read and write CSV files using the CSV package. We'll be using the CSV package more throughout the rest of this tutorial series. Now, let's take a look at another application of a table by examining the pretty tables package. The primary author of the pretty tables package is Ronan Arreyes Jardim Chagas. It's not a very large package, but it does some amazing things. Let's start by converting our table into a pretty table. Nothing displays when you hover over the output, so let's try it in the REPL. Maximize the REPL and type in My Pretty Table. Hmm, nothing. Try typing in just the function. Ah, there it is. 
The prettyTable function does not return an output, so you can't assign it to a variable. Let's compare this pretty table to our table. The pretty table does look nicer, but that's not the real reason I wanted to show you this package. The pretty tables package also generates HTML code for your table, which is wild. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, which is the standard markup language for documents designed to be displayed in a web browser. So, if we can generate HTML code for our table, then we should be able to see it using a web browser. I found this code on Discourse from the user Pontus. All I did was take that code and turn it into a function so I could reuse it. Now, let's try out our new function. Go to your Explorer and click on your HTML file. This is what HTML code looks like. Close the HTML file. Go to your desktop and open your HTML file using your browser. Pretty cool, right? You can also view the HTML file in VS Code by installing an extension. Click on the extensions icon and search for HTML Preview and look for version 0.0.6 .0 by Analytic Signal Limited. Go ahead and install that extension. Now, go back to the Explorer and click on your HTML file again. You should now see a preview of the pretty table in VS Code. Being able to view your data in a browser may not seem like a big deal when viewing a small dataset like this one, but you'll thank me later when you start to look at large datasets. As long as we're adding extensions, go back to the Extensions menu and search for CSV to Table and look for version 1.2.3 by Andrew Armstrong. Go ahead and install it. Go back to the Explorer and click on MyTable.csv. Now, go to View Command Palette and select Convert to Table from CSV. Close the Explorer to expand the editor. Nice, right? OK, enough with the warm-up acts. Let's get to the star of the show, data frames. <laughs> Imagine that you have a dataset with hundreds of columns and millions of rows. We know that using a matrix to analyze data can be a challenge, even with a small dataset, so there's no way it can handle a large dataset. We also know that a table is a more practical data type for analyzing datasets. However, the two packages that we looked at are primarily formatting tools that, by design, offer limited functionality. In order to handle such a large dataset, we need a tool that is loaded with features that can scale up to datasets of any size. This is what the DataFrames package is for. I'm not sure who originally created the DataFrames package, but the current public face of the DataFrames package is Bogomil Kaminsky. In addition to all the work that he's done on the DataFrames package, he has also created a lot of DataFrames tutorials that are available for free online. Links to his tutorials are provided in the description below. In addition to the tutorials, the online documentation for the DataFrames package is very comprehensive, so it's an excellent resource as well. As an introduction to DataFrames, let's start by converting our table into a DataFrame. Hovering does not offer a great experience for viewing a DataFrame. Let's look at it in the REPL. In order to get comfortable working with data frames, let's build a data frame from scratch. Let's go through the same exercise as we did when we built our matrix. As a reminder, here's our challenge. Given the raw data, complete the following tasks. 1. Create a single data frame containing all of the data. 2. Calculate the revenue, profit, and profit margin for each line item. 3. 
Calculate Company A's totals for quantity, revenue, and profit. Four, calculate Company A's overall profit margin. And five, create another data frame containing the totals for quantity, revenue, profit, and profit margin. The first step is to create a data frame. When setting up a data frame, the convention is to use df as the variable name. Setting up a data frame is similar to setting up a table. Instead of using the table function, you use the data frame function, with the header names to the left and the column vector to the right. This created a 3x5 data frame. Next, let's calculate the revenue. As a reminder, the revenue is the quantity times the price per unit. Just like with a table, you can index an entire column by using the dot syntax. Using df.revenue actually created a new column in your data frame with the header name revenue. Recall with our matrix, we had to do the calculation first and then do a horizontal concatenation to add this to our matrix. Next, let's calculate the profit. As a reminder, the profit is the quantity times the difference between the price per unit and the cost per unit. Our data frame is getting too large to view in the editor. Maximize the REPL and type in DF to see your data frame. Next, let's calculate the profit margin. As a reminder, the profit margin is just the profit divided by the revenue. Again, maximize the REPL and type in DF to view your data frame. So that was pretty easy. A lot quicker and much more practical than using a matrix. Let's continue with our challenge by calculating the totals. Now that we have these totals, let's calculate the overall profit margin. Now that we've calculated all of our totals, let's create a new data frame with the total values. This looks a lot nicer than our matrix with the totals. Maximize the REPL to view both the matrix and the data frame. You can also view your data frame by using VS Code Display. That looks really nice. You could definitely work with that. Save your data frame as a CSV file. Open your Explorer and click on MyDF.CSV. Go to View Command Palette and select Convert to Table from CSV. Close the Explorer to expand the editor. So, those are three different views of your data. Let's see if we can save the data frame as an HTML file. Go to the Explorer panel and click on MyDF.HTML to view it in VS Code. Now that we know how to create a data frame, let's explore it further. The data frames package provides some summary information about your data frame. Start by using the describe function. Unfortunately, viewing this information in the editor is quite challenging. Maximize the REPL and type in the describe function. The describe function generates a data frame 
about your data frame. Now, how meta is that? The output is really quite fascinating. It's like going up to your data and saying, so, tell me about yourself, and then having the data reply back to you with this information. You'll recall that there's also a describe function in the stats base package that does something similar. In addition to providing you with some basic descriptive statistics, the describe function in the data frames package also provides a listing of your variable names, as well as letting you know if any data is missing. For a small dataset, getting this information by yourself is relatively easy, but for a large dataset, having this describe function is a huge time saver. Here are some additional summary information functions. nrow and ncol will give you the number of rows and columns respectively. Size will give you the number of rows and columns in a tuple. Now that we have a high-level overview of our data frame, let's take a closer look at the column names. Names will give you an array with your headers listed as strings. Property names will give you an array with those same headers, except listed as symbols. When referring to column names in a data frame, we'll be using symbols and not strings. What if we want to rename our headers? How do we do that? Because the output is getting more challenging to view in the editor, here, rather than hitting Shift Enter, hit Control Enter. What Control Enter does is that it copies your selection and pastes it into the REPL. Expand the REPL. Now hit the up arrow. That's the line that was copied by Control Enter. Now hit Enter. Notice that the first column is now Company. Now type in DF. Notice that the first column is still Brand, so the rename function is not a permanent change. Minimize the REPL and go back to the editor. If you want to make a permanent change, use the Bang syntax. Maximize the REPL and type in DF. Notice that the quantity column is now QTY. Minimize the REPL and go back to your editor. Let's change the column name back to the original name. Maximize the REPL and type in DF. So, now you know how to change column names in a data frame. Let's wrap up today's session by learning how to index your data frame. As we saw earlier, you can view the entire column by using the dot syntax. As for rows, the syntax is the same as it is for a matrix. This example selects all columns in the third row. Maximize the REPL to view the output. In order to view a single element in a data frame, you select the column first by using the dot syntax, and then you enter in the row number in square brackets. Finally, here are some examples of how to take a subset of your data frame. This is not meant to be an exhaustive collection, just a small sample to give you an idea of the indexing syntax. This selects rows 2 and 3 in the revenue column. This selects rows 2 and 3 in all columns. Maximize the REPL to view the output. This selects all rows in the tier column and the revenue column. Finally, this selects rows 2 and 3 in the tier column and the revenue column. Let's take a step back for a moment and reflect on what we've seen so far about data frames. So, a data frame has the superpower ability to describe itself and to calculate descriptive statistics about itself. 
But other than that, it seems like a data frame is similar to the other tables that we've seen before. A data frame may sound complicated, but a data frame is just a fancy table, and a table is just a fancy matrix. I will leave it there for today and let you ponder upon it. We'll pick this up again in next week's tutorial. Well, that's it. Today, we went on an odyssey that took us from a matrix to a table to a data frame. Although we covered a lot of material today, we're really just getting started with the data frames package. Next week, we'll move beyond the basics and begin using data frames for analysis. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up. For more Wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Please feel free to share these videos since these tutorials are getting rave reviews. Just listen to what the professional reviewers are saying. I'm on the verge of tearing.